glory to God. We lift you up, Father. We give you all the praise and glory. Welcome to Impact Church. Thank you so much for joining us today. Come on and give God praise. Save forever, 
Hey family, welcome back out to another Relationship Talk on Wednesday night. I'm Anthony. This is my lovely wife, Rhonda Crawford. We're glad to be with you and we're glad you are with us. Now we want to delve right into some more good stuff so that we can deal with this time of quarantine, this time of uh, self kind of, you know, isolation and sheltering in that we can make sure we are coming out of it better than ever and that we are growing stronger in our relationship relationships. So with that, pray with me right here. Father, thank you so much again for your continued presence, your anointing, and your grace resting upon all of us, praise God, so we may excel in your truth and be better for you and each other. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, praise God. Now listen, if you are in any kind of relationship, you know about fights. A fight happens in every relationship there is to man. So if you are married, you're going to have some fights. If you have some children, you probably have some fights there. If you're single, you probably still have some fights with yourself. There are fights that are always going to take place. They're conflicts. And listen, the fight is not bad. How you conduct yourself that could be bad or obviously it can be good and what we want to really deal with here for uh, actually this week and next Wednesday as well about how to kind of you know uh, fight well in your in your family in, in your marriages so that when you come out of the fight it come out where you both are healthier the marriage and family is stronger and the like notice what it says here in James chapter 1 verse 19 Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. We have to learn how to control our anger, praise God. You know, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, 27 talks about the fact that, you know, be ye angry and sin not. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. You have to be able to control your anger so that if you do get into a confrontation, you can do it the right way where the marriage and family can win. Now, my wife and I, we've been married now. How many years, baby? Put her on the spot. Oh, I got it. I got it. I want this to keep rolling, too. We've been married now 19 years this year. We got married July 28th, 2001. Brownie points to the husband on this. Praise God. I knew it. Oh, oh she, I, yeah, I, I know she knew it She, because she was there. She was there. July 28th, 2001. Now, listen, we, we've had fights. Now, we haven't had any physical fights. Not, not at all. But you have disagreements. When, when, when it's another person, you're always going to have some disagreements. And of course, because we're married and we're in family and do life together, ministry together, there's times where she sees things one way, I see it another, and there's going to be a conflict, a confrontation. Well, how do you handle that the right way so that the family can continue to grow healthy and strong? These are some of the things we want to deal with. So, babe, what you got? How do you want to start us? Well, um, now that I was put on the spot. Yes, I got you. Um, well, every person on the earth who has a relationship with anyone else on the earth is going to have to communicate with that person. Mm -hmm. And in that type of communication, there's always going to be the chance, as Pastor just said, for there to be a conflict or a fight. And first, let's talk about what communication is. So communication is to give or interchange thoughts, feelings, information, or the like by writing or speaking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So communication is interchanging thoughts. So I'm saying my thoughts, and the other person is saying their thoughts. But then conflict comes in when that exchange of thoughts, there is a disagreement, and they and those thoughts kind of meet together and clash. So a conflict is to come in collision or disagreement to be contradictory at variance or in opposition or to clash. Mm. And what happens a lot of times is that as those thoughts clash, there's a sense of antagonism that is felt by either, si either or both sides about the ideas that were being expressed. And so in families, this we know that in families and in any relationship this happens but we want to be able to handle it in a way where when it happens we can still move on from that and still remain 
in a situation where we're still growing closer together instead of allowing things to come in and pull us apart. So we want to ask you today, what is your family conflict style? Mm -hmm. When you think about conflicts that arise in your family, how do you handle them? How does your family normally deal with different situations of conflict? That's what we want to get into today. Mm -hmm. and, and from a, a business perspective, you, it's typically identified as five conflict styles. One is avoidance, uh, the other is accommodation, another is compromise, another is competition, and then the ultimate goal is really collaboration. So we're going to deal with a little bit of that you know, as we kind of go through this over the next couple of weeks. But what we want to do first is really look at what it shouldn't be, what our conflict style shouldn't be. And we want to look at an extreme case, an example of a family, and it's King David. Now, King David is anointed as the king of Israel. As a matter of fact, he is now coming to the place and time where he's no longer running from, from Saul, so there's not this kind of divided thing. He, he's overseeing, you know, all of, of Israel. And even though he's anointed as king, even though uh, he's been ordained as king, you find that there is great dysfunction in his family. See, listen, just because you have a relationship with God doesn't make, you know, family health automatic. You have to work this. You, you have to, you know, make strategic plans to breathe health and life into the relationships in, in your family. David, unfortunately, saw a lot of dysfunction. So we want to talk about, you know, really an event and, and a processing of how they handled a conflict and, quite frankly, how they handled it the wrong way. And our prayer is that none of us will fall into that trap of handling conflicts the wrong way. So, honey, you want to start here and talk to us about this particular story, 2 Samuel chapter 13? All right, so in 2 Samuel chapter 13, it's very, a very inf unfortunate incident that takes place where David's oldest son, Amnon, ends up becoming attracted to his half-sister, Tamar. And he ends up just becoming obsessed with her to the point where his countenance is changing because he is just wanting to just have, you know, this, his half-sister. And what happens is that he has a family member that comes to him and helps him create this scheme to get Tamar to come to his home and make him something to eat. And so she comes there, she comes to his home, she makes him something to eat. She's thinking that he's not feeling well. Um, and that's how everything started where, you know, David allowed her to come because, you know, he, he's portraying like, you know, he's bedridden and can't get out of bed. So she's there with him. And when she gives him the things that she prepared for him, he overpowers her and he rapes her. And it's, it's so horrible because after he rapes her, he then wants nothing to do with her. And he has her just cast out of his home and bolt and the door bolted so she can't come back in so she leaves she's just desolate she's distraught she's you know her clothes are just she's just in mourning you know she she's got ashes on you know pouring pouring ashes on herself and she has another brother by the name of Absalom who finds out that this happens and so we have this family tragedy and this family uh, situation now that thrusts everyone into this conflict situation and the way that they choose to handle it is the way that a lot of families today handle conflict and handle trage tragedies and handle situations and that's our first family conflict style that we want to stay away from and what they do is they try to fake peace. Mm. Yeah. They try to fake peace and we see that in 2 Samuel chapter 13 verses 20 through 23 this is after this terrible thing has taken place and Absalom is speaking to his sister Tamar it says her brother Absalom said to her has your brother Amnon had his way with you now my dear sister let's keep it quiet a family matter he is after all your brother don't take this so hard so Tamar lived in her brother Absalom's home bitter and desolate and then if you uh, continue to read, it goes on to talk about uh, what begins to fester 
as now the family tries to keep things under wraps and the family tries to just keep everything quiet and just go about without really saying anything. And really that is what fake peace really is defined as. It's defined as having unresolved issues that affect the way you relate to each other but you haven't addressed them for the purpose of maintaining calm. Mm. So it's just something lingering and festering there year after year, day after day, month after month, week after week. And so back over in 2 Samuel 13, verse uh, 21, it says, King David heard the whole story and was enraged, but he didn't discipline Amnon. David doted on him because he was his firstborn. We're going to get back to talk about that in a few moments. But this is what I want us to look at here. It says, Absalom quit speaking to Amnon, not a word, whether good or bad, because he hated him for violating his sister Tamar. Mm -hmm. So now Absalom begins to fester with this hate on the inside of him because of what his brother does to his sister. And then it says in verse 23, it says, two years went by. So now two years go by of the family having this secret, having this family tragedy that took place. Nobody's addressing it. Nobody's saying anything. The person who committed the, the, the heinous act has not been uh, dealt with. And then the person who now is the victim is just left to just have to deal with the situation on her own. And her brother Absalom is now developing this hatred for his other brother who committed this act. Mm. And, and, and all of it is, is just this uh, attempt at fake peace. We hear, we hear in the news all the time, you know, fake news, you know, it's not real, it's not real. And this is a case where the, the peace, you know, clearly was not real. Unfortunately, David did nothing behind this. I mean, he, he was disappointed behind, you know, what his son, you know, did, you know, to his sister. But he doesn't, he doesn't do anything. And that further enraged Absalom because he's just like, oh my goodness, how, how is, how is my, my father just going to let this go? And so rather than bringing it to his father, rather than taking it to his brother, he then kind of sits back and starts to uh, connive and put some things together. And he does it over a long period of time. Everyone now is thinking everything is fine, but it's not. Because there's not real peace there because no one, listen, has really dealt with the issue. So what you and I have to make sure we guard our hearts from is some, sometimes when there's, you know, conflict that's going on, silence doesn't mean that there's really peace there. You have to address it. You have to confront it. If you do not confront it, it will fester and typically it grows into something much worse. So be careful of the fake peace. And so... And it actually did grow into something much worse. And we see here in Sam, 2 Samuel 13, a little bit further down. Now, two years go by, as we said, and Absalom devises this plan. So he has this great big feast and he invites all of his brothers, including Amnon, which is the one who raped his sister. And he invites King David as well, but David doesn't come. And so this is what he's planning for this time of this feast in verse 28, verses 28 through 29. It says, Absalom told his men, wait until Amnon gets drunk. Then at my signal, kill him. Don't be afraid. I'm the one who has given the command. Take courage and do it. So Absalom's so at Absalom's signal, they murdered Amnon. Then the other sons of the king jumped on their mules and fled. And so he murders, he, he makes sure that Amnon gets murdered. And then a little bit further down in verse 38, it says, So Absalom fled and went to Jeshur, for he was there for three years, and was there for three years. Um, and so he makes sure that his brother gets murdered and then he leaves and gets out of the, the, you know, the vicinity so that he can escape any type of judgment. So we see what this fake peace ended up resulting in. It ended up resulting in something that was far worse than what would have happened if the item in the situation was addressed when it first happened. And if you look at this and really read into this, it could have turned out even worse because I believe the fact that Absalom wanted David to be there too, uh, there was something there that he wanted to accomplish as well. 
Maybe he didn't want to kill his father right then, but he certainly wanted to kind of make a mockery of his father and say, you didn't do anything against, you know, your son, and I've done it and did it in front of your, you and all of, you know, your, your sons. There, there was something going on in Absalom's heart, you know, that was not healthy towards his father in this as well, and you could see it. And if you keep reading later on, you'll see that Absalom's heart had really completely turned against his father to the point where he wanted to kill him and tried to kill him. Now, understand something that, that's real clear here. Absalom's, you know, initial response was one of kind of fake peace and then just kind of trying to go through the motions so everybody can just get through each day. But David also has a conflict, you know, style, you know, here as well. And his is more of avoidance. He just doesn't do anything. He doesn't say anything. He just kind of, you know, uh, hurts behind, you know, what happens, but he just kind of keeps it in to himself. Even once Absalom, you know, does this and he's gone, David still just doesn't do anything. He just lets his son go. He commits now murder, killing his other son. He goes off and David just leaves him there for three years. It's like, oh, well, I'm just not going to touch it. Listen, listen, that is a poor conflict style. We cannot just simply avoid things and hope that they go away. As children, you, you remember, you know, different things would happen and, and you would kind of pray and, and hope that it would go away. And, and maybe, you know, if I go to sleep and wake up and it, it'll be gone. And Well, that's, that's children. You have to confront matters. You cannot just let it go because it will fester. When you're in a relationship and you're in a marriage, if, if there's something you know, that is kind of untoward between, you know, your husband and your wife or someone that, you know, that you love, you got to address that. You can't just simply say, well, I I'm, I'm just going to just, just move on. I I'm not going to let it bother me. Trust me, it is already bothering you. And over time, it's going to grow. It's going to fester into something even greater. And that's what happens with Absalom there. Because of the length of time that went there for those two years and David avoiding it and not doing anything, his bitterness his hatred, his scheming only intensify. So you have to address things right away. Do not avoid the conflict. Go headlong. And I get it. Sometimes it, it can be tenuous. You know, sometimes you, you don't want to hurt someone's feelings. Sometimes you don't know how a person is going to respond. But trust me, it is better to approach it and to say something now because one, you will help them and you'll help yourself too. You'll free yourself up as well. So, yes, go ahead, Ben. What you get? And, you know, um, I wanted to say also that one of the reasons why David did not discipline his oldest son, Amnon, was because he was his firstborn. And, you know, the Bible says that he doted on him. Uh, and the Bible also talks about the fact that uh, King David really had a heart to go after Absalom, even after Absalom had caused Amnon to be killed and fled, David had this heart that he wanted to go to him. He wanted to do something, um, but he just never, never did. did. Yep. And I think that happens in a lot of relationships where we want to do something. We know it's wrong for things to be the way that they are. We know it has to be addressed. Our hearts long for that situation and that relationship to be mended, but we just are so overcome with the what ifs or the negatives that could happen if we confront the situation that we just stay in a place of not doing anything. And I think also sometimes as parents uh, you might have a child and that child, you know, you, you, it might be your only child or, or just a child that you're, you're envisioning some great things for. And you're not seeing them walk it out and you just kind of feel like, well, if I say something, will it cause a tear or a fracture in our relationship? But always remember that it's always the best thing to approach every situation with truth and with honesty. You know, even as the Bible tells us that when we know the truth, the truth makes us free. Not when we hide the truth, not when we cover up the truth, not when we avoid the truth or ignore the truth, but when we know the truth mm -hmm. and the, 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 the way that we know we know it is because we're actually living it and applying it to our lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So here, here's the third conflict style you want to avoid. And that's what you also see there with Absalom, and that's revenge. L listen, <clears throat> that's all a part of the sense of competition, you know, now where you want to get back. 
that's don't don't be so don't be so bent on wanting to win that you're just you know destroying everyone you know in the family you know what what sense you know does it make to to walk away saying yes I'm right but then you lost your your marriage you lost your kids you've lost everything you didn't win in fact you, you lost and you lost greatly so don't fall for the sense of revenge which obviously Absalom you know does where he sets up that scheme and, and murders his brother and now he takes off and, and runs I get it it was an absolutely horrific event his sister being raped I, I, I get that and, and we certainly don't excuse that at all but simply trying to resolve the conflict by getting revenge only created more devastating matters in the family for David for Absalom obviously for Tamar you know and everyone that's connected to the family now because of this tension that is going on so be careful of revenge and, and blame and you know revenge as uh, pastor was just sharing revenge starts off as blaming the other person for whatever the act is that they may have done so it starts off with this sense of blame that over time turns the heart of the person against the person who they're blaming mm -hmm. and if you go ahead and study that story you'll see that you know uh, two years happened after you know the heinous act against Tamar took place nothing happened to Amnon so then Amnon was murdered and Absalom fled so he left the country for three years and so now five years took place after this situation occurred and nothing really was done in as far as the relationships involved mm. so then David has uh, he has uh, Absalom brought back to where he was but he told uh, he told his servant that you know what he can come back but he can't see my face mm -hmm. so Absalom comes back but then for the for another two years he still doesn't see his father so that's um, that's another you know two years so now we have um, seven years Festering. since this yeah. situation took place that Absalom is blaming and he's scheming and he's conniving and he's upset and he's just boiling in this stew of blame and revenge to the point that when he finally sees his father he finally has this meeting after seven years after this situation he approaches the meeting but then he decides that he is going to turn the hearts of the people so that he can now take his father's kingdom and take his father's throne so he came to this place where this revenge has now turned him into this person who is an enemy of the very person that you know had the, that, that gave the seed that brought him into the earth mm -hmm. yeah you know it, and there's something especially for men you know men we we are you know so respect oriented you know, we spell love, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. And I would dare say, Absalom lost a lot of respect for David when he did nothing about, you know, his sisters, you know, being, being raped. And, and from that particular point, you just see him just progressively going further and further away, you know, from his father. And, and he's really, he's really interesting when you read the story, because once he is brought back, David allows him to come back. He can't see him for two years. And it wasn't a two year, you know, like, you know, sentence. David just wasn't trying to see him, you know, at all. And Absalom was like, you know what, I, I am tired of this. I want to see my father. I want to see the king. And he lives next to, um, he lives next, you know, to his cousin, Joab. And he decides Joab is actually the commander of the army, you know, for, for David. And so he won't, you know, uh, answer his calls. He, he, won't, he won't, you know, come and talk to him and so forth. So finally to get Joab's attention, he sets his field on fire, you know, so that Joab would say, wait a minute, what is going on? Why are you, you know, set my stuff on fire? He was just like, because you won't come talk to me. He says, now I want to see the king. And this is how he finally, you know, goes in to see the king. And then just like, you know, what you heard my wife, you know, sharing. Then once he gets that opportunity, he immediately goes out into the, the, the marketplace, into the city gates. And he starts to turn the people's hearts towards him. So much so that he developed a, cu a coup that David and his close associates had to hurry up and get out of the city before they were murdered. This is how bad this thing went because 
the family did not know how to fight well. But I mentioned someone, Joy, and this is our, our last one we want to share you, with you today. A conflict style that you do not want to give into, and that's one of manipulation. You, you, you see revenge, you see the sense of blame, you know, you see the, the fake peace, you see the avoidance, but you also have to make sure you stay away from manipulation. Joab, again, is David's nephew, and he's Absalom's, obviously, you know, cousin. And when Absalom is, you know, away and hiding for those three years, David is avoiding the whole situation, so he, he won't deal with it. So Job, you know, kind of designs a little, you know, plan. He gets a particular woman and says, look, I want you to go and, you know, to the king, and I want you to act like, you know, you're in distress, and then I want you to tell him the story. So he gives her this elaborate story, you know, about, you know, her, her sons, you know, being, you know, in battle and, and one killing the other. And, and now, you know, she wants to save the other son so that he doesn't, you know, get arrested and taken away. And then she winds up losing both sons. She tells us this, this whole story. And King David is like, oh, absolutely. We're going to protect your son. You don't have to worry about a thing. And so then the woman says, well, if you're going to do that and protect my son, why won't you do the same for your own? Why, why, why won't you rescue, you know, him? Why won't you be there? And David is like, wait a minute, what, what's going on here? He says, wait a minute, did, did, did Joy put you up to this? And she's like, yes, yes, you, you're, you're right. Nothing can be hidden from you, you know, you know King David. Joab had manipulated David in order to kind of come to a place of bringing his son back. He, he, he was frustrated by David's avoidance. So, so rather than try to go through it, you know, from a, a place of integrity, he, he manipulates something to get David to respond a certain way. And the way David responded was, was actually fine and wanted to bring his, his uh, son back. But the way that this transpired was never really God's heart. Listen, here, here's a statement to, to get a hold of. It's important that the role we take to truth is always honest. Sometimes people feel like, hey, you know, as, as long as, you know, uh, you know, the, the ends are good. It doesn't matter what the means are. You know, the means justify the ends. No, 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 no. Not, not in the kingdom. Not in the kingdom of God. If, if you're going to take a road to try to arrive at truth, and that's what Joel was trying to get to, you got to be honest about it. You, you can't, you know, you know, create, you know, this deception and, and manipulate things because there's always going to be something ill that comes from that. Be careful of manipulation. And, you know, we just want to share with you that wherever you are in the relationships in your family today, God is a God of restoration. Yes. He's a God who wants to bring peace. And, you know, we can sometimes sit and stew in all of the negative things that have happened in different relationships that we've had. We can try to find fault in the relationships that we've had with others. And it causes us sometimes to not necessarily act outward, but to hold everything sometimes on the inside. And we may converse with that person, but on the inside we're hurting. On the inside we're thinking about things that they may have said or things that they may have done. And it's causing this pain on the inside of us that we have to deal with every day, every time we wake up. But we want to share with you today that God is the God who heals not just our physical bodies, come on, come but on. he heals us on the inside. He heals our emotions. Mm -hmm. And he can heal our emotions to the place where we can look someone in the face that may have committed a heinous act against us. But we can look at them and forgive them the way he forgives and operate in the love of God despite what may have happened in the past. He can he can heal our heart to the place where he can restore a marriage that seems like it's just completely broken and there's nothing that can be done. He can heal our hearts to the place where he can restore a relationship with our children or a relationship with a parent. And he can heal every single scar that may be left over from the past and things that we may still see in the middle of the night when we close our eyes. He can, he can wash all of that with the blood of Jesus and cause us to be free. And something that is said in Second Samuel that I thought was good is mm -hmm. it says in Second Samuel 14, 14, 
uh, um, this is actually the woman that uh, Pastor was just talking about that was speaking to David. But she says, makes this statement as she's talking to him. She says, all of us must die eventually. Our lives are like water spilled out on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. But God does not just sweep life away. Instead, he devises ways to bring us back when we have been separated from him. Yes. So God doesn't want us to be separated from him, and he doesn't want us to be separated from each other, mm -hmm. especially those people that we are knit together with in, f in family relationships. Mm -hmm. Amen. Come on, come on. We want to pray for your families right here, right here. Let's, let's join ourselves together. Father, thank you again for healing every place where we may have hurt. Father, you know everyone's story. You know our story. You know the stories of everyone that's listening in right now. May every scar that's been formed, Father, uh, find its mending in your grace, in your love right now. Every emotional uh, struggle and torment that's been there because of what's happened in the past, Father, may they uh, be recovered by your love and, and by your presence today. Father, may every family that is present, may we all learn how to fight well. We understand there's going to be disagreements, that there's going to be conflict, Father, but we don't have to be disagreeable in it, but we can always follow your spirit, we can follow your leading, we can follow your plan. Help us, Daddy, that in the moments when something has rubbed us the wrong way, that we don't avoid it, uh, that, that we don't you know, operate in fake peace, we don't blame someone else, and we certainly don't try to manipulate an outcome, but we turn to you and we turn to those that we are in love with, our family and our friends, and we work on this together. Father, our prayers that all of our families during this time, in this high tension time and season that we're in with this pandemic, that we would all experience your peace, your shalom, where there's nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing out of place, and that we all work hard and vigorously together to have healthy, strong families that love you and love one another. So we thank you for this. We give you praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, if you receive that, say, I receive it. And we receive it for our families. In Jesus' name. Listen, it has been our absolute you know, pleasure once again to be with you. Matter of fact, even before I do that, anything else, baby, you got in there you want to share? You got it, honey. All right, glory to God. Remember that she did not remember the anniversary. No, I, I did I, remember I that the back anniversary. Uh -uh. I did. Thank you very much. We, this is a bit of a conflict <laughs> here. We'll work on it when this is all over, praise God. Well, hey, well, we love you all. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We are praying for you. This too, this coronavirus shall pass. So stay encouraged. Do not get down. Choose faith over fear. And remember, you always win. Love you. Be blessed. And we'll see you soon. Bye.